Clarity is power. I know what I want. I know why it matters. And I say yes to those things. Most men live in quiet desperation, like just dying inside to actually live. Let's go. Oh man, we hate results, don't we? There's a group of people out there who want results, who want to be held accountable, who want to hold others accountable, and who want to create the most amazing, incredible results, period. You can't be the doormat. It's beautiful to see when people like, I do deserve. I am going to treat myself. You need to wake up. So, Tema, as, as a pro football player, you won a Super Bowl with the New England Patriots. Then you got injured. You lost it all. You had to rebuild. It was really like a classic hero's journey. And now you coach thousands of people to help them rebuild and take on these new challenges. How do we know if the plans that we've created are the right plans? How do we know if the actions we're taking are the right actions? How do we know if the time and money we're investing into these new ventures are going into the right places? There's one tell, the easiest tell of all is results. Go look at your results. Go take your clothes off. I say this on stage, go take your clothes off, stand butt naked in the mirror, look at your body. Yeah. yeah. Open up your phone, open up your bank account, results. Look at the quality of your marriage, your connection, your intimacy, your love, the way you feel when you're with your spouse how you feel about your spouse, how you feel about the world. And then spiritually, right? What are the results with your purpose? And that's how you can really tell what someone believes about who they are. Go look at their results and that will tell you who they are. We, oh man, we hate results, don't we? Because like results force you to know what you want. And often I think we're afraid or embarrassed to admit what we want. Results force you to say, hey, there's going to be this like black and white line in the sand. I'm doing it or I'm not doing it. It's working or it's not working. And all of that specificity, let's get specific with what our goal is. Let's get specific with our timelines. Let's put together a plan. Let's put together milestones so we can measure whether we're moving forward or not. All of that stuff leads to accountability that none of us want. Right? I wouldn't even say none of us. Like there's a group of people who want that. And the people who want that, the accountability, who want to be held to a standard, they're the ones who are like, okay, I'm going to say what it is that I want. I'm going to have courage to say what it is that I want with, you said specificity, super clear, specific. And there's the reason why there's the haves and the have nots and or the wealthy, healthy, happy, and those who are not. There's a reason why the majority of the world is to speak truth here lives in a very mediocre life, average life, and it's a hard pill to swallow. Most people know my life is killing me, but is it really? Or have you convinced yourself because you lie to yourself that it's really good? I love what Henry David Thoreau says, right? Most men live in quiet desperation, like just dying inside to actually live. So I believe 100%, my man, there's a group of people out there who want results, who want to be held accountable, who want to hold others accountable, and who want to create the most amazing, incredible results, period. Yes. That's why you're the world's greatest results coach. And here's the thing. We want it. You mentioned the body, right? I used to be much heavier. And then I lost a lot of weight because I had momentum. Hey, two years ago, I went on this health challenge and I got really cut. Like At 38 years old, I was like, I wonder if I can get abs for the first time in my life after being a fat guy my did whole you? life. I did. I hired a personal trainer. I started lifting weights for the first time. I went on a super aggressive cut where it was like, over the course of five weeks, I went down from 2,400 day calorie down to 1,600 a day calorie, like just week after week of dropping. And I saw the greatest results in my life. I told my wife this the other day. I was like, those four weeks, I remember those four weeks, March of 2021. I was so surprised. It was hard as hell, but I was so surprised. I was like, I can't believe that in four weeks of focus and hard work, I did what I not only what I never thought was possible, but it happened so fast. And so since then, I've just bulked up, let's say. Like I put on a lot of muscle and I still lift, but I'm like way heavier than I want to be. And I almost can't remember that version of me. I almost can't understand how I was able to do it. I keep thinking about I had leverage on myself then and I guess I don't have leverage now. But I'm someone who hates mediocrity. I'm someone who wants to be extraordinary. I'm someone who wants to get super specific and have big dreams, get the results. And yet, I still find myself backsliding month after month, year after year. I still find myself going back to what's comfortable and what's neutral and like the old version of me is creeping in and it scares the shit out of me. And I guess I know what to do. I have to do it is the answer. I don't know why I won't do it. So you're using the body as an example. <laughs> yeah. But this could be money. This could be relationships. This could be could spirituality be or faith right. or anything. 
could be anything, but you will use the body. It is number one, it's not healthy to be in that state. It looks good. It looks really good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Being like nine percent or ten percent body fat. Yeah. <laughs> it ain't really that healthy. But again, you gotta look at bodybuilders or people who step on the stage. They look that way for half a day, one hour, and then they gotta feed their bodies. So again, you gotta just have this perspective. Even for myself, I'm 300 pounds right now. I am in a cut. I play a long game of health. So three months of bulk, November, December, January, I eat a huge surplus. You want to put muscle on, you're going to put a little bit of fat on, maybe a lot of fat. Then I take about four to five months to then strip the fat away. So I look really good in the summertime. I will maintain that and then I will do it again. And I want to pack muscle in my body, increase my cardio. So again, you just got that perspective. Are but I, you... I guess what I'm asking is the answer for any area of our life we want to see results in is to just do the work. And yet so many of us won't. And my coach keeps saying, you just don't want it bad enough. And I guess I go, yeah, I guess I don't want it bad enough. But it's not even it, right? Let's think about this. There's two parts of a result. The first one is, what do you want, right? It's the thing itself. The second component of what we deem as a result is, why does that matter? And Mm -hmm. Simon Sinek, why? Begin with why. We're like, why times five? Why? Why does that matter? Why does that matter? There is a why that is deep, way beyond the surface. Well, because I want to be healthy. The deep why, or what I call a holy cause, it has to be the thing that's what I really want. And for most people, that there is no why to maintain the lean. You don't need it. It's not like there's a bear chasing us. Why? Because I need to live. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, again, the deep why, when people get into a situation in their lives where they're like, I have to, I need this because it means way more than just looking good physically or money. People say, oh, I want to go make a million or 10 million. No, you don't. You want what that's going to give you and make Mm. you feel and how you're going to impact other people if you can dig deep enough. So like I just tell people, in fact, I just posted this on my Instagram. I'm like, look, just don't pretend if you don't want it. The best thing you could do is be like, I don't want to be 250 pounds, 250. My wife's like too small. Don't like mm-hmm. it. So yeah, I, when I got down to 167, which was my like leanest weight for the photo shoot, and I didn't even realize because you talk about how you're only like that a moment. I literally was like dehydrating for two days, doing all the stuff for prep. They had me take maple syrup stuff right before so that way I could get a little bit of carbs to, to have some veins pop. And then we did a really quick lift. And then my coach goes, Okay, you got eight minutes. And I was like, What? And he's like, Your body will only look like this for eight minutes. Let's go. Get the photos in. Let's go. And so now I have these photos, but I forget that it's like, it's not even reality at all. No, it's not reality. So again, you got to have some real perspective here with the body. It's not about a look for me. It is about weaponizing, sharpening. I need this weapon to be able to produce, have peace, handle pressure, handle stress. And of course I want to look good money. It's okay. I know a lot of guys, let's be real. There's dudes who have a lot of money. Way more than us. Yes. I can't yes. speak. Way more than me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dudes are miserable. Come on, man. They're like, they're sedating. They're cheating. They're just doing stuff or they're just super unfulfilled. I'm like, that's not what it is. So you really got to dig deep into this. What do I really want? And it's not num- open up my account, see numbers in your bank account. No, it's how do I want to feel? Real quick, I just had this thought. Like, there are wealthy people who are desperately unhappy, and there are poor people who are desperately unhappy. We can turn to alcohol and we can turn to weed and we can turn to harder drugs. We can be obese and have a lot of money. We can be obese because we're growing up in poverty. Like Money doesn't seem to fix a bunch of those things for most people. We go to different parts of the world, extremely happy poor people, extremely happy rich people. We go to other parts, extremely unhappy poor people who think society didn't serve them and schooling wasn't good enough and the world is against me. And the same thing's true with wealth, right? And so is it just about being one or the other? Can we fix that within ourselves? The easiest question is, what do you want? And then go get it. Again, it's like people like, there's got to be more than that. I'm like, no, look, if you could be happy, poor, and you can be happy, wealthy, be happy, wealthy, like figure (laughs) the game out, right? It's like, figure the game out. There's internal work that's got to be done. There's work here. There's work here. Like, again, that's what I do for a living is... Yeah, we really help people to figure out who they are, the purpose of their life, what they really want for their life, 
how to go get it and how to be at this place. Again, I don't like the word balance. I like the word harmony to live a life with, I call it daily life experience, right? It's like, I love my life. I love how I live. I love the business that we've built. I love my family. I love contributions. And my nephew the other day says, Hey, I got this fundraise. I'm like, how much you need? He's like 20 bucks. I was like, I'll make just give you 500 bucks. He's like, what? I'm like, yeah, here's 500 bucks. And then this morning at the gym, another one's like, Hey, you could donate like how much you need. Okay. Here's 500 bucks. I like being able to give. I like donating. I like giving back. And again, it's just, it's not a one or the other. It's just, what do you want? And that's the most simplest way for me. Like I want wealth. I want time. I want health. I want connection. I'm really clear about what I want. So I go build that and architect that lifestyle. And I love it. And I hope our people do the same thing. Let's break down what it takes to actually feel like you deserve all of those things. It's your life. No one's going to do it for you. No one's going to make you the center of their life. No one's going to do your work for you. No one's going to figure this out for you. But it does take, in my experience, this little switch to get over the feeling of selfishness, to get over the feeling of self-centeredness, to say that I deserve this. That it's not just for others. It's something I can do. It's something I can work on and no one's going to do it for me. And so to be able to structure your relationships so that way they serve you as much as you can serve others, to structure your schedule so that way it's the schedule you want while also still helping your maybe your clients or your business or your team or being there to support them, being there for your kids, but having boundaries, being the man that you need to be to show up for your spouse or your wife or what have you. Like All of these things take this weird mental flip of, I need to focus on me so that way I can show up for you. And let's be honest, people think that's narcissistic. It's super self-centered. It's, oh, it must be nice that you can set up your whole life and your whole world for you. And my answer is like, yeah, but shouldn't we all be willing to do this? But yeah, you can too. Yeah. You've we're not, you and I terms. aren't delusional, right? We're not crazy. We're not no. stupid. We're not extremely, we're not super privileged as you know, I'm a white guy and you're Samoan. So it's not like it's just because we're men or just we're bald or just because we grew up in a certain culture, right? Like people can do this, right? I got a text message from my niece and she's like, uncle, can you give me something today? I'm like, yeah, I got you. You will only ever live the life you choose to create, period. And again, people have this in the victim mentality. I still get it occasionally. A victim mentality is out of my control. What God doesn't want. That is an old paradigm operating system that does not work, especially if your heart calls to live this life of freedom, this life of wealth, this life of contribution, this life of adventure, this life of giving back. And to the people who are like, oh, that's narcissistic, you're selfish. I'm like, look, you do you, you stay where you're at, and we are going to climb the mountain and enjoy the fruits that most people will not ever enjoy because you choose to stay there. And it's a paradigm shift. I love seven habits, Stephen Covey. Like you have to have this paradigm shift. I, I coach a lot of people who that's their thing, especially when you coach women. P women are like, I just feel so guilty for spending this money on myself. And I'm like, that is training. You have been trained, taught, and educated to believe that. How is it working? And it's not. It doesn't work, but it keeps them stuck. So we have to infuse. We call it unlearn and then relearn. Got to unlearn. The way to unlearn is you have to become aware. Look at your fruits. Look at your feet. Look, look at how you're living. If you don't like that, then you get to go do something different. Then we have to strip all these patterns and these belief systems. We have to relearn on repetition over and over again. And it's beautiful to see when people are like, I do deserve. I am going to treat myself. I am going to be selfish. Says, yeah, even Christians. I'm a Christian. And people are like, oh, I got to put others first. I'm like, to a point. You can't be the doormat. Like you think God wants you to be a doormat? So for the mother, sacrifice yourself for your husband, for your children. I'm like, time out. <laughs> I don't know which God you worship. That's not the God I worship. And there's so much training out there. There's so much old paradigms and old operating systems rooted in scarcity, which is driven by fear, driven by doubt, and driven by lies, not truth lies. So once people get this pitch, wait a minute, you're telling me I can do that. You're telling me I can have this. I'm like, yes. And what level you're on, there's guys who make a ton of money, but 
their body and their marriage is off. So we help them go get those things up and then life is just better. So again, old training, you're trained, taught, and educated. We have to help people unlearn, relearn these new patterns. And that's what the protocols and principles and systems are all about, what we do. Let me tell a quick story. But the question I have is whether you think joy is the result. And the reason I'm thinking this is because as you're talking, I I know you have three boys, pretty much the same age. I have four kids. And my wife wants to give all of my kids the activities and the opportunities and all the stuff that she felt that she wasn't able to have. I do the same thing too, right? When I was growing up, I wanted dirt bikes. Guess what I got now, right? We got dirt bikes. I go out dirt biking with my son. We have 14,000 <laughs> acre forest right near us. I'm going to go dirt biking with him. Why not? But my wife always loved horses. And yet, so my daughter, my 16 year old loves horses. So my wife gets my daughter horseback riding lessons and she's going there and she comes back and she's oh, it's like the people are nice and everything's amazing and blah, blah, blah. And I said, why don't you do horseback riding lessons with our daughter, Rachel? And she's like, well, I don't know. It's her thing. And I said, who cares if you're 39? Who cares if it's meant for kids? Like, I can see how much envy, like not even envy, but I can see how much joy you have watching her do it when secretly you wish you could do it. Why don't you just give yourself permission to go out and do this? It's not that much money. Whatever it is, $200 a month. Just go do it. And you can spend time with our daughter and have this deeper connection. And then she did it. And it was like, to me, it was this unlock where I was like, oh, I almost have to tell my wife that she has my permission to put herself first because she will not do it. I realized that the only outcome of this, we can rationalize this. She's a performer. I could say all kinds of stuff, right? It's great for the CV. It's great for the thing. It's great training. But at the end of the day, the result is joy. Like this brings her joy. We are fortunate enough to have the time and money to do it. So why not give herself once a week this two hours with a horse and getting the joy that we could easily do if she just gave herself permission to do it. First of all, I love it. Love that you do the motorcycles. I love that you do the horseback (laughs) riding. And I love that you're like pushing your wife to go do this. And I get it. Why? My wife's the same way. There's a piece of, especially I've seen in women, not just women, but more in women than men, just the way that they're raised in society to believe that their role, caretaker, kids first, husband first, home first. It's very hard for some of these women to go do these activities because deep in their mind, there is a story that they believe to be true that says something to the effect of, if I do that, then I'm selfish. And again, the story could be a number of things. If I make too much money, then I'm an evil, snotty person. If I spend this money and take time for me, that means I am blank. And most people never question these beliefs or stories because they think it is the truth. And it takes some real coaching and it takes training. And even for some people, like they're so attached, they literally think it is the absolute truth, capital T, capital A, absolute. No, this is the truth. I can't spend this money on myself. And until you challenge the stories, until you challenge and question every thought, people just live lives of misery. People live lives of quiet desperation. People live lives of like playing small, dimming their light, others first. And then they wonder why there's a piece of them because your heart wants to be free. Your heart yearns to be happy, to find joy. You're like it deep in every human being, most human beings are wired to want to be happy. So for your wife, it's like she is looking for permission. And then if she gets coached and gets trained and gets, again, it takes people to like just open and right compartmentalize and move things away and let go of. Be amazing how they start to give themselves permission. But even just to say, Again, women, because I coach women and I coach men, but some it just gives them permission to finally say, that's what I want. And they won't even say it. They can't even say it because it goes against an old paradigm or the way they see themselves. This is why the first question you ask, I said fear that I'm like, no, it's how they see themselves. It's their self-definition. Mm. So your wife shifts that or any woman or if any man, it's amazing. Everything just opens up if they can change how they see themselves, which then in turn changes how they see the world. I follow you on IG. And we were saying before even recording, like I've followed you for a long time. And so I was so excited to connect with you. And part of what I appreciate about you is you say the things that I agree with, but I just 
don't know if I would have the courage to say. And so I don't think we have to have a conversation about with any kind of terms like woke or politics or any of that stuff, because what you're saying to me just makes sense. It's like very true. And here is, here's an example. You know, like you posted a few days ago, why do men today take so much pride in the things our ancestors would be so ashamed of? It's not okay to be weak. Get stronger physically, emotionally, spiritually, relationally, mentally, and financially get stronger. I would agree with that. And it's, that's true. I don't want mediocrity. I do want to be stronger. I've, my, my word of the year, I don't usually do word of the year. I've never done it before, but I was like, for some reason, a week ago, this word respect came into my head and I realized that I'm not respecting myself. I'm not respecting my body. I, if I don't, it's winter time here, but if I don't shovel the driveway properly, it doesn't hurt anyone but me and my family. But at the same time, it shows a disrespect to my neighbors that I'm not even willing to keep up for the neighborhood. If I see garbage on the street, I would always pick it up. I always pick up garbage because to me, that's the honorable thing to do, but it's also a sign of respect. And so I agree that it seems that we're missing something that we once had. The way men should show up, the way women should show up, the way we should treat kids, the way we should raise them, our expectations, our standards seem to be slipping all around. And yet, I do know that there was a lot of toxicity in the way that our ancestors lived. There was a lack of emotional communication and there was a lot of addiction even back then. And there was a lot of abuse and there was a lot of bottled up tension that was also very unhealthy. So I don't know what to do with any of this. But I guess the question I have for you is, let's just draw on the good things. What are we lacking today that our ancestors knew that we should do as men or women to be stronger? I love the question. What are we lacking today that our ancestors knew, but we're not doing today? Number one, I think we go back to what's one of our principles. Principle number one is the truth will set you free. You got to go back to the truth of what's our current reality, the truth of who we see ourselves as, the truth of where we at life. Just tell the truth. What's the truth of your relationship? As a man, do you date your wife? Do you take care of her? Do you provide? Do you connect with her? Do you connect with your children? Speak your your wife's love language, right? That's a popular phrase. And I'm like, basically, are you giving your wife what she wants? Are you giving your children what they want and what they need? It's the same thing for us as men. Like, what's the truth? Now, if you can take that principle right there and make, okay, cool. My perspective as well is, look, there's just... The world has changed so much. So I'm like, okay, this is interesting, right? If I wanted to control someone, I would dumb them down. I would flood their mind with pornography. I would make them dependent on me. I'm like, man, that sounds kind of like big government. What we live today is not the way. The but, it's, but, it's government, but it's government tied in with capitalism though as well, right? Like what's good for government is good for business. What's good for business is good for government. There are, I don't want to become too much of a conspiracy theorist, but I agree that if we can keep the population uneducated, if we can keep them undernourished, if we can Weak. take away the hopes or the dreams and addicted to television, terrible food, Cell phones, narcotics, whatever yeah, it is, it, like let's everything. just keep people, you know, the education system produces Dumb. labor. It does not produce yes. great Critical. people. And like you said, the word capitalism, I love capitalism and anything can become a vice. Anything. The word of God can become a vice. If you say, you need to give all your money to God, you need to read your scriptures. I'm like, I, I actually need to go work out. I need to go take care of my family. I need to earn a living and I need to give back. I'm not going to spend 24 hours a day praying and fasting every day. For the, now, now, if that's your calling from God, do it. So anything can become a vice. And we'll go back to your question. There were some things our ancestors who were stormy beaches at age 18, like they weren't perfect. We aren't perfect. But I say principles govern. So I'm like, get strong. Be able to think critically, have skills. Know that if things hit the fan, you can still earn, you can still provide, you can use your hands, you can protect your family. Like you have to be able to have this belief and hope. And again, it's one of my beliefs, no matter what happens out there, what happens in here, most important, like no matter what happens with interest rates. And so I always tell people like your internal economy, it matters. It really matters, not the external economy. And again, we coach our people in this. I don't care what interest rates do. I don't even care what the happened because I cannot control big government or greedy capitalists. Or what I can't control is how I see myself, how I see the world, and how I see opportunities. One of our principles is dollars follow value. So if I can create enough value in a marketplace, dollars follow that. 
I pay them, I get money, I go pay them, they take my money, I get services. Like, and it's just a beautiful thing. And I just see a lot of men today, they've fallen into the trap, addicted to screens, addicted to sugar. They believe everything that is on TV or a screen. I'm like, you need to wake up. You think they want you to be strong and wealthy and critical thinking. You think they want you to have great marriage. You tear a family apart. You tear communities apart. There's not going to be World War III like the way we saw World War II. They don't need to storm our country with military. They're in already through the apps, through the programming, through the agenda, through the propaganda. And that's why I'm like, I limit my kids and I'm teaching my kids constantly, showing them like why we're not doing this. And I'm training and I'm teaching my kids. And again, I tell my kids like at 18, my job is I'm still going to be your father. But you got to learn, I believe in God. Like you got to develop connection with God. You have to learn how to think and ask and not be afraid to confront things. You got to learn how to take a stand. You got to learn how to live on less than you earn. And if you want to have a big lifestyle, you earn way up here so you can have big lifestyle. And again, what do we have today or what are we not doing today that our ancestors perhaps were doing? That's a very simple lifestyle, man. Again, there's the programming going on today. I believe there's programming back then. It's ruthless today. And so you have to have your eyes open. You have to turn your brain on. And I believe that you have to depend on a higher power to help you see the truth of what's really going on. And then I don't get up and, oh my gosh, it's conspiracy. I don't go and get lost in that stuff. You said this earlier, right? I can control what I can control. I can control what I do. I can control what I take into my mind. If you feed your body plastic and all this processed foods, you're going to feel like crap. Again, I'm not going to go extreme. Like I just hit Chick-fil-A this morning, right? I get it. (laughs) For the most part, like you really got to be aware. And it goes back to, again, what do you want? I got to say Chick-fil-A milkshakes. Oh, (laughs) we don't really have Chick-fil-A up here in Canada. So when I took my daughter to Atlanta in November for a Blackpink concert, we flew down together. And I see a Chick-fil-A and I was like, Rachel, we're going to Chick-fil-A. And I like, she's like, aren't you on a cut? And I was like, screw this. So a big part of, I think, what we have lost as men. And I think, I don't know if you, if you follow Scott Galloway. He's a professor who really looks at statistics and looks at like the rise of loneliness amongst single men. The fact that, with, that for the first time ever, it's been declared. I don't know if this is true or not, but it's been declared that a single woman is not at a financial disadvantage to a married woman. For the first time ever. So mm-hmm. as women, if we look over the 70s, 80s, 90s, and we looked at the rise of independence and the rise of feminism, and there's still a whole bunch of stuff that's tied up in that. But if we look through the fact that men are being raised by single mothers, perhaps more than ever, that men may not have a father figure that they require, that we're becoming maybe softer as in the self-esteem movement of the generation. And so men are not getting the things that they need to be men, whatever that means to you. And women are becoming increasingly independent, which means that lever that we had where it's like, hey, women, you have to put up with our crap because you you rely on us. Yeah, because you rely on us financially. They are becoming more independent. They are putting up with less and less BS. Not only that, men aren't being trained to approach women, to love them, to respect them, to be their cheerleader, to be their coach, to be their partner. And Galloway, at least, is saying, hey, just so you know, we're raising the red flag. Like, we are in trouble as a society. And I've even witnessed this myself. My wife and I got married very young. We were high school sweethearts. So even though we're turning 40 this year, we've been together 23 years. Wow. And we've been married... uh, We're going to have our 18th anniversary. And I know that there are times where she was desperately unhappy because she was living the way society said. Stay-at-home mom, four kids. But she knew she was called for more. And I know that I find her being more independent, developing her own skill sets, developing her own friends group, developing her own world. Like I find that the more that I push her to be the best version of herself, not only the more attractive she is to me, because it reminds me of when we started dating, super independent. But on top of that, I am proud that she picked me. I'm not insecure because she's getting bigger and bigger in her own energy in her own life. Every time she shines brighter, I'm just like, yeah, that woman picked me. Let's go. Let's go. And I don't know if that's normal or not. We just learned this over the last few years, spending a lot of time together and me watching her bloom. But how can we as men show up for the women in our life? I love this, man. First of all, kudos to you, my man. You've got it figured out. 
A lot of men it don't have that. It made me super uncomfortable, man. <laughs> it really did. Oh, I'm, telling I'm like a little you, like, jealous and I'm a little <laughs> controlling and I'm a little, I don't know. And then I just realized, oh, wow, like she's so much happier and I love a happy wife. <laughs> but Mark, that's the game. Like any man who sees his woman rise, it's natural to have an insecurity. Oh my gosh, is she going to want me? Those are normal. That's why I tell guys, get ready for the cycle of feelings. You got to get through this curve. But you ask the question, how do we show up? So I believe that's my role as a man. I also believe that women are called and they have these feelings in their heart, this calling to do more. We don't live back in the 40s where the, she's going to stay home and iron and a little house on the prayer. Like women today have dreams and desires. Women have things they want to do. Can so I just tell you, they, they always have. I was listening to, I'm listening to the biography of JD Rockefeller and uh, one of the richest men who built Standard Oil and other things. But his wife, <laughs> before they got married, because they got married at 27, his wife was a school teacher with her sister. And she was a vibrant, energetic woman who loved being in the schoolhouse because that was a career path that a single woman could have. But she loved her career. She loved learning. She loved education. She loved everything. And you could say the 40s, but and this is a cultural thing, but we can go back hundreds of years. Women have always wanted Wrong. to do something, right? <laughs> and so you look at society, right? There's just... <laughs> social status quo, social norms, more than ever, it's 2023. So it's like, there are avenues, there are courses, there are so many ways for a woman to rise. And in our language, we have a program called Shield Men. I'm like, I'm helping these grown, incredible women who are business owners, entrepreneurs, they do incredibly well. And yet there's still a piece of them that's like old school. Ah, I feel guilty and bad. So the greatest thing we can do as men is like, look, Show up to help your goddess do what you're doing. Support her. Give her an environment. Give her resources. Encourage her. Cheer her on. Listen to her. Give her space. So for me, it's like my wife has an account. She has her own money. I don't care what she spends it on. I just make sure the account gets filled to a certain amount. And she never worries. I then encourage her. Hey, you want to take a trip? You want to go over there? I got the kids like giving her opportunities and an environment where she feels safe and secure to go do her own thing. And then again, man, if your woman begins to rise, don't be a jerk and have scarcity. Oh, her rising means that I'm weak. Nah, that's scarcity. Support that. Have some powerful conversations, deal with the insecurity. And I love what you said, because I feel the same way. Like I love my wife so much. I love her. She loves me. We have an amazing marriage. And I am very clear. Like, she don't need me. And I don't need her. And once we got to this place where like, we're not like, oh, I would shrivel up and die if you ever left me. I'm like, nah. And I love it. My wife said this to me, just so you know, I'd be okay. I was like, I'd be surprised if you weren't okay. If something <laughs> happened between us, I'd be surprised. She's a powerful woman. So my I do not is, want my wife on the other side of the table. I'll just tell you that. Like, <laughs> like I tell her often, I'm like, I am afraid of you enough with you on my side of the table. If we're separated, I do not want to deal with that version of you. <laughs> it's got to be just pretty simple that, that strong people are attracted to strong people. Weak people are attracted to weak people because of comfort zone and other things. My wife and I, we talk about this often. We go for a walk every day if she's not working. But we go every day, 4 o'clock for a walk for about an hour together decompress, talk about things. Sometimes we don't have anything to talk about. We just walk silently. But the other day, I, I was saying, like, what was it that attracted me to you? And this is going way back because we were young. But she's, listen, I've always liked your ambition. I've always wanted to go places and I trust you and all of these things. And you know what? There are times, though, where I've struggled, where I've struggled with depression, where I've struggled with anxiety, where I've struggled to, to have confidence, where the, my world has been crashing around me. And it's not that my wife doesn't love me or isn't attracted, but I'm not fulfilling this role that we've agreed that I should do, which is to lead and be bold and to be courageous. And so there's sometimes like she's turned to me, I don't know, two years ago. She literally said, Drager, you got to get your shit together, man. I'm just telling you right now, get your shit together. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> cool. I got to do this. So you said about being 250, right? If you got down to 250 pounds, when I was yeah. at my lightest, she didn't like how lean, how hard I was. Didn't. So at the same time, they, they, they want this like this strength, but they also want just room to, to cry and room to be upset. When she's feeling angry, I've learned, she just wants room to bitch about stuff. That's Grace. what she wants. So I just got to show up that way for her. Amen to that. You're spot on. Our women want to be able to talk and be heard. 
again, women in general, I believe, especially my wife, they want to be seen. They want to be heard. They want to be understood. And they want to feel like they are being seen. They want to feel like they're wanted and need. They want to feel like their voice matters. It's crazy. Early on in our marriage, my wife, and we had an agreement. When we had kids, she was going to stay home, get the kids up to a place before she'd go work. I wanted my wife in the home. I grew up in a home where my parents had to work. Parents were never home. So I was like, oh, I want something different. Once our kids get to a certain age, I remember I'd go hire these coaches. I'm spending $25,000, $100,000 for a coach or a mastermind. And I'd come home, I'd be like, man, I just learned this. And my wife's like, she's looking at me like, dude, I've been telling you that for like five years. <laughs> yeah, but and, this person I paid a lot of money. To. <laughs> and she was right. And I had to shift as a man. I'm like, whoa. So I shifted about nine years into marriage. I'm like, okay, my wife is my business partner. She's my consultant. She's knows my comp. She knows it all. So I counsel with her like, you guys going to walk. I counsel with my wife about everything. Investments, money, marketing, events. I event. I show up powerfully. I lead and I give her the space. I wasn't always a good listener. Mm. I'm like, I got to be present. Are you this guys time. opposites? Like this whole opposites attract type thing? Have you noticed that, that her strengths fill your weaknesses and your strengths support her weaknesses? For us, that we are definitely not the same. I hug people. I hug, I'm like, oh, hey, what's up? I'll give people a hug. <laughs> okay, so physical touch is your love language. We oh, figured this out. Huge physical touch. So she's, she's not. And then we walk into a store into an elevator. By the time I get to the 15th floor, I'm the big joke. I will be at that man's wedding at his line. I'm like, best friend. <laughs> You're carrying the casket at his grandmother's funeral. <laughs> and my wife's like, don't talk to anybody. I walk into my gym. I know everyone by first name, high fives, hugs. My wife just walks and does her stuff, walks out. So I'm very like vocal and outgoing. And my wife's like very observant, mm. notices everything. Mm. And there's a lot of things where we're opposites and it does really well for us. Yeah. I've only figured this out recently. The more time you spend with people, the more you come to understand them, especially with your spouse, the person who should be your cheerleader, who should be on your side, who should want what you want, or you guys work together to get there. But <laughs> do you remember this song? I'll be the brains. Or sorry, you be the brains. I'll be the brawn. Let's make lots of money. Do you know that song? I do not know that song. Okay. It's like some song from the 80s, I think. And it's like, anyway, I'm not going to sing because I suck at singing. But it's funny. The song was in my head. We're out for a walk a few months ago. And I'm like, you be the brains. I'll be the brawn. Let's make lots of money. And she's not the brains. You're the brains. And I was like, <laughs> I don't think I am. Like, I know you think I'm smart and all this stuff, but I'm like way too in my head. And I, I don't see things through. And like, I said, how about we just spend the next few months with you being the brains and let's see how it goes. It went way smoother. Everything was great because she had defined in herself a certain role. And it was just some area we never talked about. Somehow 20 years into this, we just never talked about it, never thought about it. And she thought that she was one way and I was another way. And we realized that like I was following her lead. She was following my lead. No one was leading. <laughs> do you know what I mean? I do. And I look at the way you are. I love that. I've never done that before with my wife where I'm like, let's just try it where you lead. And with my wife... I am the gas pedal, like full throttle, Nas, rocket fuel, and she is the brake, the emergency brake, and whoa. And it has served us because I know how I operate and I know who I am and what I want. And I'm like, so much of what we built is because I am full throttle and we have to go. Yeah. And a lot of the protection of what we built has come because my wife's like, pulling the reins, hold on. Let's make this sustainable. <laughs> yeah. She's like, stop. <laughs> So I love just the way we operate together. Yeah. And just for men out there and or women or same sex, doesn't matter. Show up for your partner. Be a listener. Listen to learn. Listen to understand. Be quiet and listen. Be there. Be on their side. Be in their shoes. It takes skill. It takes practice. But for all of that, it just takes a desire to say, what I want is to be madly in love to be connected, to be understood, heard, seen, and to have my partner feel the same way and to have a relationship that we can survive and thrive under every pressure, every outside influence, the trials and challenges that life is going to deal with us. And if you can do that, 
commit every day, commit every day. Just like, how can I serve my wife? How can I make life easier for her? How can I allow her to be her best? Like marriage is amazing. If you do that, if you become super selfish and like, and play these revenge games and these silent treatments play, like those are childish games. And I see a lot of marriages because of ego and pride. What are y'all doing? I've tried that. There was a three month period, like maybe over a decade ago, where I said, you know what? I'm just going to start treating my wife the way she treats me. It did not go well. (laughs) Where I was like, you know what? I think you're being hypocritical in these areas. So I'm just going to, if you do this to me, I'm going to do. It did not go well. And then I heard Rob Bell and his wife, they released this book years ago about relationships. I don't remember the name of it because it was some weird kind of Zen Japanese name or something. But they said in an interview, like when you start dating people, you like you said about dating them, right? You're you're playful. You play, you have fun. And I heard this thing and he's like, you hit a point where everyone wants to work. You want to work on your relationships. I need to put work in. And he was like, why don't we just go back to playing? Like the best business ideas come from when you're not grinding away on things, but there's some room for play and for ideas and for trying things. And in your relationship, if you can go back to dating back when you were curious and you were interested and you were playful and you laughed and you joked and you flirted. flirted and you were like, yeah, created yeah. and you're trying to win her over. Right this is the forward. funny thing. I spent three months being like, I'm going to treat you the way you treat me. It did not go on. Then suddenly I heard this. I was like, never mind. I'm going to flip the switch. I'm going to just go play. And about a week later, not only had things completely like been amazing, what's the matter with you? What's you're being completely silly. What's wrong with you? And I was like, oh, I'm just trying to be more like we were when we were younger. And that has served me well. I agree, man. Sometimes I get super, super serious with work and kind of the athlete mentality. I was done playing sports 20 years ago. And every once in a while, I just, I fall into that. Hey, boys, let's go short. Hey, let's go. And my wife, she'll just, we have an agreement. She just puts her hand on my shoulder. She just like touches me. Doesn't even say a word. I'm like, Okay. And then I can flip to the most goofy, happy, normal. Like my boys are like, oh gosh, this guy's here. I'm like, whoa, let's go, let's go. And I start being a goofball. You're right. But sometimes we get to have fun, man. Now have I've heard you say fun. agreement twice now. What does that mean? Because you're being very intentional and you're saying my wife and I have agreement. So you mentioned that twice. What does that mean? Yeah. Principle number 10, we have 13 principles. So principle number 10 in the curriculum is agreements, not expectations. And when people have expectations, they suffer. When people live in expectations, they're miserable. When people, they expect things, it's not clear. Golly, it's just, it doesn't work. So we tell our clients, create powerful agreements and live in those agreements. An agreement is really simple. Two people create something or more. What, by when, by how, by who. Like real, just powerful. The way you create the agreement is so much of it. So we have agreements. And it works. Like our agreements are like, we don't do silent treatments. We don't do the whole not talking to you. We just talk. I'm not ready to talk. Cool. When you're ready, I'm here. I love you. And we have agreements. My boys, we have agreements. Like They have to read 10 pages a day. They got chores to do. They got things to do. And they don't get Switches and Nintendos and Xboxes. But aren't those week. your expectations you're forcing them to do? No, like, how is no, that an agreement? So I love it. Great. Because you actually go create it with the other person they get by my boys yeah not even but more like here's the result we want and i want to create an agreement with you and you can say no to it and but if you say no you need to come up with a better way to do this most parents have demands or forced expectations the agreement is co-created right two people create this together they both agree upon it they both see the end result of why they're going to keep this agreement my boys know more than ever, like procrastination doesn't work. They've learned some hard lessons. So you do your chores. Our family works. Our home works. If you don't, first few times they didn't do it. I went up out of bed. Let's go. 1030 at night. We had an agreement. Like once you establish how things roll, people are just like, okay, if I don't make the money and pay the bills, We don't live in the home or the cars we have. So agreements are powerful. They're not a one way. It's two ways created, two ways that are agreed upon. Both are like, I will do that because we both want the same thing. Very powerful way to do it again. Spend like 90 minutes teaching this when we do it, giving it to you in 90 seconds. But we live by agreements, not expectations. I have found that with my team or with clients or with people in life, we don't like the specificity of it because there's an accountability tied to it. 
I often tell people that I'm going to do something that I end up not hitting the date for because I just overcommit. And people give me passes. And as long as they give me passes on things, because they know how busy I am... You just keep doing it. Right? I'm just going to keep doing it. And I notice yeah. it and I hate it because part of the man that I want to be is I want to be true to my word. If I say it to you, I want it to happen. Or there better be like an unreasonably weird reason why. But I can see this pattern for maybe 10 or 15 years. This is still something where I say stuff because I'm excited. I say things because I have hope. I'm optimistic. I'm a starter. I'm not a finisher. I always think it's going to be faster. I always think it's going to be easier. And I always think it's going to be cheaper than it turns out to be. And so I'm starting to see it. But my go-to will be to make fewer commitments, to say fewer That's things, to put answer. myself out less. But is that the answer? Because then it's... It is. The, so it's like this. And you got to go back to what do you want? But that vagueness, if I don't make the commitments and I don't do anything, that gives me the out to still not... Do you know what but I mean? It's like an excuse to me. Just remember this. Everything you say yes to, you're saying no to something else. So the more you can say no to the things that do not matter, it allows you to say yes to what matters. And one of the first things we start with clients is like, where are you lying and breaking your word? We're going to start there. Yeah, we can dive deep into why they do it. Okay, cool. We can solve that. But then it goes back to what do you want? If you want to be a powerful person who is respected, who garners respect, who can lead, who people can trust, you got to keep your word. So if you commit to 20 things, I'm like, you're a liar. You ain't doing those things. And how, where else does this play out? Yeah. How does it affect your marriage? How does it affect you as a father? No wonder why you are living at like 40% capacity. So we just showed up. We're like, look, stop saying yes to everything. Get really clear about what you want. And all the things that you want require yes to necessary required actions. Once I'm clear about that, the answer is through, I'm, I am unable to commit to that. I can't commit to that. Have other commitments. Sorry, not able to do that. The answer is no. I say no because I want to say yes to what matters. I don't want to be caught at the whim of external and like everyone. The guys like you and me, let's be real. We can do a lot of stuff and people <laughs> want us to do a lot of stuff. That doesn't mean we should. So I just go back to clarity's power, principle number four, clarity's power. I know what I want. I know why it matters. And I say yes to those things. So you put your values, you put your purpose, you know what you want, you make it super clear, and then you build a wall or you value your goals more than other people. I want to say other people's goals, but it's more like you value your goals more than serving other people that take you away from your goals. Yeah, if you want to put it like that, 100%. Now, if they're asking me to do something that falls in line with what I want, then let's go do it together. And occasionally, I will say no, and yet I call it the voice. That internal voice of God, spirit, whatever you want to call it. I call it the voice. The voice says, you need to do this. I'm like, okay. My kids will ask me for something, and I'll be like, I can't do that. I'm sorry for these reasons. And they make sense to me, and then I'll walk away, and I'll just be like, I could I really do it though? Could I really? They're asking me to be there for them. They're saying this, but they don't really want this. They actually just want one on one time or they just want this. I get this weird. Yeah, Some people might consider it. it the Holy Spirit or whatever it is, but it's just like this. Oh, okay. I got to show up a certain way. Okay. And I'll go back and I'll be like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I said that. I thought about it. Thank you. Let's do yeah, it. Look, that you really got to be able to listen to that. That's why I go back to the truth. Once you really know what you want for your life and you're super clear, you can live your life inside of agreements that allow you to go get what you want. And I love what Zig Ziglar says, right? The more I help other people get what they want, AKA have skill sets and mindsets to create value in the marketplace to serve, solve their problems, fill their needs, I get dollars. The more I do that, I get what I want, they get what they want, we both get what we want. And a lot of people today, they are not clear. So they will say yes to everybody. And then they wonder why they're miserable, why they're empty, why they don't fill their own cup. They don't know what they want. They're living for other people. and. It's like we said earlier, you only live the life that you choose to create, which means you have to make a choice. Hey, here's what I want. And you've, you've said this a few times. I noticed that you're like, we don't want to be held accountable spe specific. In our agreements, we are super specific. Like, I'll have it to you by the end of the week, Thursday or Friday, Friday at the end of business day, four o'clock or five. What's your end of business day? And when they say five o'clock, this is how I create the agreement. Just want to be clear, man, Mark, I'm very clear. 
you're telling me that I will have this in my inbox by five o'clock on Friday. Is that what you are agreeing to? And they're like, yes. I'm like, great. Just so we're clear, can you just repeat back to me the agreement that we're making? I like clarity. And when they say it back to me, they're like, I'm going to have this to you by Friday at 5 p.m. Pacific or 5 p.m. Central. I'm like, great. Can you do that? Can you agree to this? And I, the first time I make an agreement with someone, I'll tell them, I live in agreements. My life works really well. I like to deal with people who I can trust and count on. So if you're telling me this, I'm going to count on you. We're going to have a great relationship for business. Are you agreeing to do this? And they're like, yes. I'm like, great. I'll count on it. We have an agreement. Thank you. Yeah. You know that on Thursday night now, they're like, oh, sh- I said I was going to make that happen. Oh, man. Yeah. I'm not going to watch TV. I'm not going to do this. I'm like, I made a commitment. I better do it. And that pressure is what sees it through. I love what you're saying. I need to get... Not I need to or should have or whatever. I must get better at this. I have an accountability partner and we get together every two weeks. And when we started, there was a lot of, I'm going to do these five things over the next two weeks. And he's like, are you really? Are you sure? Like, you're going to do all of those things? And I was like, yeah, man, come on. And then I had to kill myself. So by the skin of my nose, like three minutes before the call, I'm like finishing stuff up so I could show up and say, I did it all. And then the next week I was like, okay, I'm only going to do three things. And then the next time it was like, I'm only going to do one. Because <laughs> I figured out sometimes I tell you I'm going to do something in two weeks. This is going to take me a month. And I don't even realize it. Or it's just it's an exhausting is, way to live. It is exhausting to not be your word. It is exhausting. It just makes me feel like a liar. People. I don't want to be a liar. I hate that. Uh, I hate being a hypocrite. I hate being a liar. I don't know that I am. It makes me feel bad about myself. It's just, I want to be true to my word. I want people to be able to trust me. I want them to know that I'm operating with integrity and that with their best intentions at mind, that's who I want to be. And so whenever I do overcommit or I don't live up to my... Like right now, top of my head, I told my one of my team members last Thursday that I would have something to them for Monday and I didn't get it to them. I have a whole bunch of reasons why. There's a whole bunch of competing interests and there's a whole bunch of stuff happening, but it bothers me that I told them they'd get it Monday. You and I are now speaking Tuesday afternoon my time and I still don't have it to them. And when I look at my calendar and my schedule, I realize that I have all of these back-to-back priorities and projects and I'm probably not going to get them Friday. Well, look, if you make a mistake, if you mess up, immediately go clean it up. And in a perfect world, you would have been like, on Monday morning, we're like, I need to clean something up with you. I committed to you today. I'm not going to have it today. And apologize. Can I get it to you on Friday? Will that work for you? Simple. Clean up the mess. Create a new agreement. And if they say yes, then you need to double down and be like, I will get this to you on Friday at this time. And then you have to do it. If you're constantly cleaning up your messes, I'm like, dude, you're a freaking liar. Stop. I don't do business with people I don't trust. It's just really silly. In my world, the world that I have built, the reality that I have is our people keep their commitments. My clients keep their commitments because of who I am and the way that I create the agreement with them. Not casual. Agreements are not some casual, hey, I'll show up. Like We had a team meeting yesterday and people were like two minutes late. And I said, time out, guys. Before we started the meeting, I'm like, listen, are we going to start it on the hour or should we just say we're going to start at five after the hour? And I looked at the entire team because it don't work for me to start two minutes late. Y'all know how we roll. I get it. We're coming off of two weeks of events. So what's it going to be? They're like, on time. And if you're on time, you are. And they're like, late. Yeah. Show up early. Clear? Clear? All right, let's go. If you're going to lead powerfully and like really be a difference maker, a game changer, you better hold a standard and you better be that. I want to be held to a stand. I want that. So I live that. I command it from my people and they can call me out. If I'm off, I want it. I want the smoke. I want them to tell me, you said you were going to do this. My boys know if I say it, it's done. Get emotional. But my boys know if I tell them it's happening, it's going to happen. So I don't overcommit everything. But if I tell them, I got you, I'll be there. Okay, you know cool. what? Our agreements, I asked if you were good until 15 after the hour. It's now 16 after. So maybe I should come back to you now and say, how are you for time to continue this conversation? Or do you got to go? I got like five more minutes with you. My, my assistant. I'm, so, I'm, I'm like, so glad we did that because I, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, I want to keep this conversation going, but I want to respect <laughs> your time. So I'm going to start practicing this already. And just to circle around on that, you know what? I had this small moment, but an excitement two years ago, maybe a year ago or two years ago, my daughter's an artist. 
And she didn't really have a great art space in our house. And so during COVID, we're home and all this stuff. And I have the best of intentions. And I say, Hey, why don't we turn this empty space in our basement into your art room? She's so excited. And she's so thrilled. And we make a little bit of progress. And then summer comes. And when it's summertime, I work outside. When it's wintertime, I work inside. So summer comes. And so we don't make progress. And then winter comes. And I'm focused on other things. And I realized that this is moment where my daughter goes casually. She's like, are we ever going to do this thing? And she's asking because she, cause I, I made her a commitment. But I realized that every day that went on that we didn't start working on this basement art room for her, I'm proving to her that her dad doesn't live up to his word. That he might say things, but they may never happen. And I talked to her about this. I said, listen, I, Rachel, I really struggle with this. I need your help with this because I have a lot of priorities and I want to do this for you and I want to give this to you. But can you help me with this? Can we get this done together? Is there something that you can do? Because I, I stuck at organizing stuff. So if a week goes by and we don't make progress, can you say, are we going to make progress on this week? Can you take a little ownership over this thing? And I will come up with the money and I will come up with the plan and I will do the stuff you don't know how to do. But, but can you help me with this? Because... I would hate for years or decades to go by and for her to be an adult and go, Hey, remember that time that you told me you were going to build this thing for me that you never oh. did? Oh, dude, <laughs> that, that destroys me. And I got to tell you, at Christmas, I went out and bought the window we wanted to install. I hired the contractor. They're here literally right now. They're holding off because they're going to be banging through a concrete wall. Yes. And I feel so good, even though I feel terrible for how long it's taken, a year and a half. But I feel so free and I feel like... Momentum, progress. I'm not a liar. I'm going to give this to my daughter. And so, just as we wrap up this conversation, which is thank you so much, it's been amazing. I'm just like, yes, you're right. Agreements are powerful. Expectations make no sense when you don't talk them out. So much of what you teach is just black and white. Just talk, share, commit, live up to your word, be honorable, stop finding the easy way out. It's a really simple approach, actually. In our language, I call it be powerful. Be powerful. Be your word. Like we have a definition of power, but Mark, that's what I'm talking about. How to live powerfully and create results that matter. And it, our first thing is you keep your word, your power rises and people believe in you and they count on you and they trust you. And what the beautiful thing is more than other people trust in you, Mark, trust you. If I say it, it's done. There's no leakage of power there. And when a man or woman knows that they can trust themselves, that's when confidence goes to certainty. And when there's when a man or woman is certain, I know who I am. I know. Oh, we're going to go hit these numbers? Done. Foregone conclusions done. Because I said so. That's the power of keeping your word. And I appreciate you having me today, man. It's been awesome. 